How's that for a slice of fried gold? Are you think this is a fucking costume? This is a way of life. I'll be back. Just a flesh wound. I'm not gonna hurt you. I'm just gonna bash your brains. Take your sticky paws off me, you damn dirty ape. I'm sorry, Ben. I'm afraid I can't do that. It's alive! It's alive! It's alive! I guess everyone's a time of one good scare. This episode's going to be a lot of fun since we all feel like a bag of hammered buttholes. <laughs> a can of smashed assholes. <laughs> cool. That's from The Arrival. Do you remember that movie, The Arrival? Did a Charlie Sheen one? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Wow. Does that feel like a can of smashed assholes? I've always remembered that line for some reason. I don't remember anything else about the movie except for the alien's weird knees. Feels like a good description. It does. Well, I mean, that's a, a that lot I, of being hung over does like it you get time to practice and come up with fun <laughs> phrases you think you are you saying charlie sheen ad lib that probably 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 <laughs> it's probably legitimately how i felt that day that's true they just have, you didn't even <laughs> know the camera was going <laughs> well, well anyway, hello. that's how i feel today <laughs> yeah welcome to cinema shock the podcast exploring the stories behind your favorite cult and genre films i'm your co-host gary horde Hey, I'm Justin Bishop. We're joined today by, I don't even have it in me to come up with anything. <laughs> Mr. Todd A. Davis is here I'm, today. Welcome I'm to Todd the show, Todd. Davis. Hey, everybody. This is going to be a good one for the listeners. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, the reason know, that it, we we all, we just, yeah. we were at a bachelor party last night for frequent guest DJ. We're all old, and so today we woke up just <laughs> feeling, I just like a, I feel like, like a, a piece on ass. Ed Geed's Kitty couch. That's what I feel like. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. I, I bet that couch would be, like, really comfortable to be taking a nap on right now. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. Honestly. I wouldn't turn it down. Not today. <laughs> hey, we're going to do our best, though. We're going to do our best to educate everyone on the next film in our... That's our yeah. level of commitment to you, the listeners. Yeah, we could have put this off. We could have <laughs> not recorded a day, but we did. But, we, but we're doing it anyway. <laughs> Whether that's a good idea or not remains to be seen, but we're here and we're doing it and we're in episode four. Yes. Episode four of the tragedy of Toby Hooper. Are you guys enjoying the ride so far? I always enjoy rides with you guys. Yeah. It that's feels so like dirty. a, I there see, this is how it's bad. Like I feel like there's a joke to be made about the fun house and a ride and, uh, and I just don't, I don't have it, man. <laughs> Gary, I don't, uh, I don't know. You just want to read my notes today? I'm going to go take a nap. <laughs> Back when right, Toby so, Hooper and Kim Henkel. No, I'll, I'll let you guys do it. So back when Toby Cooper and Kim Henkel <laughs> were <laughs> were under contract with Universal, uh, one of the this is we're just going to start. Okay, you guys good? We're just I starting. feel good about it. Yeah, yeah that's okay. it. Go ahead. Back when Toby Hooper and Kim Hinkle were under contract with Universal, one of the many unmade projects that they were attached to was a remake of the classic Howard Hawks sci-fi movie, The Thing from Another World. You guys have seen it, I'm sure. You've probably seen the remake. Uh, they were brought onto that project by William Friedkin. We talked about him last year. and or Last year, Jesus Christ. Last episode. <laughs> Feels like last year, honestly. <laughs> they were brought into the project by William Friedkin and... Uh, they were going to write and direct the film for producer Stuart Cohen, and they would eventually leave that project. And I couldn't find any information out on why. I don't know if it was just a, things weren't clicking, the screenplay wasn't coming together. I'm not really sure. But they ended up leaving that project, and which, of course, left that project in the very capable hands of John Carpenter, who would end up creating, you know, one of his best films, in my opinion. Then after leaving the thing, Hooper discovered that there's an old project that he'd been attached to that had started to gather steam following the success of Salem's Lot. That project was based on a screenplay written by Larry Block entitled The Fun House. Who will dare to face the challenge of the fun house? Who is mad enough to enter that world of darkness? 
something is alive in the funhouse. Something not alive like its father. Something better dead. Something that has the form of a human, but not the face. This better be good. It's gonna be great. Something that feeds off the flesh and blood of young innocents. Come on, here we go. This is it. Something that tonight will turn the funhouse into a carnival of terror. The Fun House, coming soon from Universal Pictures. The Fun House, it's a carnival of terror from Toby Hooper, the director who terrified you with the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. So I don't know a whole lot about this Larry Block guy. I tried to look into him a little bit. He's written some stuff. You know, his IMDb bio says that he was a longtime friend and associate of Stan Lee and that he wrote many of the early Marvel comic screenplay adaptations, including Doctor Strange, Fantastic Four, and Captain America. Of course, none of those got made except for Captain America. That was the 1990 version that was uh, directed by infamous B-movie uh, director Albert Pyun. And it's actually I mean, a lot of guys, fun. That's a fun it's one. It's not. It's very bad. It's, it's, <laughs> no, I, I, I mean, didn't say it wasn't bad. I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can have fun with it. It's, doesn't he have, like, ears on his? Oh, yeah. They yeah, they went, yeah they, went, they, went for, they went for comic book authenticity. So he's got yeah. those little wing thingies hanging off the side of his head. Albert Pion, the, the guy who directed that, he's an interesting character. He did a lot of really bad B-movies, but stuff like Cyborg. He did a lot of Cyborg movies. Mm. Anyway, that's not a rabbit hole we're going to go down, but he is an interesting character in the world of B-movies. And he probably thought that Captain America was going to be like his big break, but we all kind of know how that turned out. I'm curious. I mean, I, I guess the Fantastic Four that Larry Block wrote wasn't the Roger Corman one because that one did technically get produced. So it exists on like IMDb, whereas Larry Block's Fantastic Four does not. So I assume it's a different project yeah. than that Roger Corman one. Well, didn't they do? There's a Doctor Strange. There's a Doctor Strange movie out there like from that time. Well, is there earlier? It's okay. Well, it's not on Larry Block's like IMDb, so I assume that mm. whatever one maybe got done. Yeah, maybe this was in like an early treatment it, or something. Yeah, maybe. I'm not really sure. But anyway, that's just a little side tangent about that guy because I, I don't know. It, there's not a lot out there about him. Mm. But he did write The Fun House, and The Fun House was to be produced by Derek Power and Mace Newfield. So Power, Derek Power had been a producer on The Dark which we discussed last week, uh, while Newfield's credentials were a little more, uh, I don't know, a little more valid, a little more prestigious. Uh, he had been the executive producer for Richard Donner's The Omen prior mm, to this. Nice. But it was, it was Power, who was an associate of Hooper's because of his involvement on The Dark, that first brought up the idea to Hooper, uh, or, or the idea of Hooper directing the film. So he, produ- he approached another producer by the name of Mark Lester, Kind of letting him know he's like, I you know I told H- H- Toby about this. Toby's interested. Let's see if we can get him on board. Then Newman got involved because he and Derek Power actually shared like an office space, uh, and it was Newman because of his connections, because of like the Omen. He, he had done some bigger movies. He was able to get the script in front of executives at Universal after he got involved. So the thing is, when the film was originally being developed when Larry Block began writing it and when Toby Hooper signed on to direct it uh, before Mace Newfield got it in front of Universal it had been intended to be just kind of a low budget horror movie with a shooting budget of about $400,000 but once they got Universal involved Universal's like all right yeah we'll do it and they the budget kind of ballooned it became a studio movie and it all of a sudden had a budget of three million dollars which is still not like a huge budget but you know, compared to 400 grand, it, it definitely is. Yeah. Toby Hooper don't work for less than six mil. <laughs> he, he only works for less than six mil, it seems like. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it, here's a fun little story about the about the script. So, or about the writing of the script in, in Larry Block. When Larry Block signed on to write the script, he was offered a rate that was based on the film's budget, which at the time was, you know, like I said, 400 grand. So he got paid like a few thousand bucks. Mark Lester says that he got paid he, five or 10 grand, you know. Uh, but when the budget w- went up to $3 million after Universal got involved, Blocks paid it and go up because his contract had been signed prior to Universal's involvement. So he just got paid kind of 
Yeah. He kind of got shafted, honestly, because yeah. he yeah. got paid based on the original agreement. That's shitty. But yeah. there was somewhere in his contract where he had managed to get a clause in there that said that he owned the book rights to the Funhouse. So when Universal came along, they wanted to publish a novelization, which, of course, novelizations, you know, the early 80s, late 70s, all the way through the 90s, really were very popular. But Universal decided they wanted to release a novelization of this movie. They had to pony up some cash to get the rights from Larry Block for the, for that screenplay. Ah. So he d- did end up getting paid in the end because of that. But here's where it gets really fun. This novelization was written by a guy named Owen West. Owen West was actually a pseudonym for the horror author Dean Koontz. This is very early on in Dean Koontz's career, and he was writing under other names and, and doing things like like movie novelizations. Nice. If you've watched the movie, which we'll, we'll discuss the movie in, in more in depth here in a bit, but if you've watched the movie, and hopefully at this point, if you're listening to us and you have, then you know that this is a film that's a little bit light on plot. Uh, kids go to a carnival. They get terrorized. That's all you really need. That's, that's what the movie's about. But if you're writing a 300-page novel, you got to flesh things out a little bit. So that's what Dean Koontz did. So in the book, the character of Ellen, which is Amy, the main girl, her, her mom, who's barely kind of a character in the movie. Um, but in the book, she's like a major focus. She's like one of the main characters. Yeah, because, well, you'll tell them. <laughs> what? What? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I was just thinking about it because I was reading about the book today. So I was just thinking, I was like, I, I guess you're going there. But, yeah, uh, I mean, you can jump in if you want. I just, uh, <laughs> no, I'm trying to get amped up, man. I'm trying. All right. To- <laughs> All right. Well, I'm just going to keep going then. All right. All right. <laughs> so <laughs> there's a reason she drank it, is what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, because you do see her in the movie with a drink in her hand and seems to be drunk every time you see her. Uh, and she's kind of a shitty mom, it seems like, too. But in the, in the book, so in the book, she's got this whole backstory where in her early twenties, she was married to a man named Conrad. This is a character from the movie, but he never gets named in the movie, but he's the guy that we know of as the carnival barker in, in the film, the main one. So in the book, in her backstory, the two of them had been married and they had had a child and that child had come out as more of a creature than a human. So she murdered the child. And then was like beaten, like had the shit beaten out of her by Conrad, by the Barker. Uh, he was, you know, he wanted to murder her. He wanted to kill her because she had killed his son, who she, who he like loved, you know. Yeah. Uh, but he ultimately like opted for the, like doing the long con instead. He's like, I'm. He's gonna let her go, in the hopes that down the line she would remarry and have other kids. And then one day that car, that the carnival would come to the town that she lives in the carnival that he works for. And she would be able to like torture and murder her new kids that she cares about. Meanwhile, everybody that uh, worked at the carnival with him was like, I don't know, man, that's a, you know, we Seems like a long shot. To, <laughs> that's a lot. That's a lot of stuff. That's going to go into that plot, buddy. You got yeah. it. Well, it turns out it worked out for him because the carnival does come to her town. And then, Amy, Ellen's daughter, Amy, and her friends happened to visit that carnival. And he and and then Conrad and his new son is a different son who is also deformed like a monster. Honestly, Conrad should maybe stop having kids because I was about to say wrong. he needs to go to a doctor, <laughs> jerk off in a cup and see if they can <laughs> figure kids, out what's going on with his stuff. If your kids start keep coming out like this, you know, <laughs> then there's something going on. You have uh, what is called once, once, fool, fool me once. Shame on me. <laughs> Shame on you. How's that go? Fool me, can't yeah. fool me again. Yeah, fool me, can't fool me again. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so so Amy and her friends come to town, and his plan works. So he gets to hunt down, you know, these kids and torture them and kill them. It's so it's stupid and wild, but the, the novelization is so wild that people initially thought that Hooper and Universal had bought the rights to, a, to an existing book and, and adapted it to a film. And then just cut out like all the backstory stuff and just focus on the carnival stuff. Cause in the book, this three, it's like a 330 page book. And this, the carnival stuff takes place in like the last 30 pages of the book. The rest of it's all backstory. Oh, so wow. people thought that they had just bought the rights to this novel and then cut all that stuff and out and just focused on the, the carnival stuff in the movie. But that's obviously not the case, but it, it was kind of that, that rumor was kind of, 
spurred a little bit by the fact that the movie would end up get, being delayed. So the novelization came out much, much sooner than the movie. So the, the book was on the shelves for quite a while before the movie came out. Huh. And as a, like a Dean Koontz novel too, or, you know, Dean Koontz has a lot of fans. So it well, feels at the, like at when the you time go, it was a Owen West novel. Well, at I mean, time, but now like you, you, when I look this up, you see a lot of people talking about this novelization yeah. more so than you would normally. I mean, I mean, not, sure. not at the time. I mean, I just, at the time it wasn't, he wasn't very well known, but be after Dean Koontz got kind of well known later on, as they started re reprinting this book, they definitely capitalized on the fact that it was a Dean Koontz book and started putting his, his real name on it. So back to the film cast in the film's lead was uh, Elizabeth Barrage. Uh, this is only Barrage's second role. She had had a small part in a movie called natural Ener enemies a couple of years before. Um, although she would later become probably best known for her role in Amadeus where she played Mozart's wife. Uh, she was really young in this. She's only 18 in this which makes that first scene a little she looks very young in this. yeah yeah she looks <laughs> really young i was like <laughs> wait a minute other cast members included uh cooper huckabee miles chapin sylvia miles and in a small but memorable role william finley uh who we last saw in another small but memorable role in toby hooper's eaten alive where he was eaten alive now he gets to be a wacky magician yeah <laughs> he got to learn all that stuff like he got to be taught how to do magic tricks. They, they had a magician come in and teach him how to do all that stuff. Yeah. One thing I thought was interesting with this is that they, because of that kid had to, you know, go to the East coast for most of the shooting and, or, you know, the child labor laws on the West coast. Yeah. Yeah. They had to shoot. Um, They, they couldn't shoot in LA because they were only allowed to shoot. You're only allowed to legally shoot with kids like during certain hours. And they're, I guess the laws are different, like on the East coast and West coast, or maybe it was just because of, the, the time of year or something. I'm not really, I, I couldn't really pin down exactly why, but yeah, that's, that's the reason they get for shooting this on the East coast instead of the West coast is, is something to do with child labor laws. And they couldn't because, because of the kid, the, um the, the younger brother, they had to shoot. Normally you can't shoot with kids like in the middle of the night, you can't do night shoots with them. They can't shoot after a certain time. So, right. Right. Uh, so then in another role in the film, the role of the Barker, was Kevin Conway. Kevin Conway was a, was a stage actor who'd appeared in a handful of films in the decade leading up to the fun house. Although his career, if you look at it, like he's one of those guys that I look at his filmography and I'm like, this guy should have been like a really like well-known character actor. And he, he was a character actor and he did get work, but I feel like he's, his career never really took off the way that I think it should have. Cause he's one of those very captivating, very kind of, uh, I don't know, charismatic film presences you know so he's fun to watch on film uh he did though appear in star trek on star trek the next generation as Alice. a clone of yeah like, yeah, Alice, yeah which is a pretty <laughs> pretty big character in star trek lore yes yes he is so after scouting locations you know they've decided they're going to shoot on the east coast they end up settling on a filming location in florida just outside of miami at ivan tours studios ivan tours is where they shot flipper <laughs> so oh. they actually, yeah. So they actually took a 1940s era carnival. This is in the off season. They're shooting in the off season, so the carnival's not uh, not being used. It's this carnival that was located in Akron, Ohio, and they rented it. And they pack up the entire carnival, and the carnies came with them, <laughs> and they moved it and rebuilt it on the studio lot in Florida. So they actually hired the carnies to set it all up and make sure everything was working. Just they set it up basically as if it were a working carnival, just in Florida instead. Well, wow. the uh, blends to the authenticity for sure. Yeah, it really does. I mean, it looks like they just found a carnival to shoot at. It mm -hmm. really does. Uh, and th the main ride, though, the the fun house where the film's creature lives was built from scratch. I mean, they, they built a facade for that that didn't exist in the in the carnival with the big fat lady, you know, animatronic, uh, which I love. I think it's a great visual. But uh, and then they built the interior on a soundstage. Uh, of course, it was once again produced uh, or it was once again designed by production designer Mort Rabinowitz, who we mentioned Mort Rabinowitz last week because he worked on Salem's Lot with Toby Hooper. Um, he built the but house. It should there. be noted. Yeah, yeah. He built he built the the house, but it, it should be noted like we didn't really mention this, but Rabinowitz is like he's kind of a big deal in production design. He had won an Oscar. Um, in the late '60s uh, for a movie called "They Shoot Horses, Don't They?" So this was 
you know, they're getting production designed by an Academy Award winner. And his work here is just stellar. I mean, we talked about the house and we've talked about production design a lot on this series because it's it seems to be a big thing for Toby Hooper, you know. Uh, but we talked about his house design for the in- interior of the Marston house last week. And like his his work here is just as good, man. Like, he, I just think he is doing some really like it adds so much to the movie, I think. Oh, he, yeah. he puts more work into it than carnies would. I don't know how many state fairs you've gone to, but the idea that these carnies put together a three-story building with working offices and uh, whatever the hell was going on in that basement. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> giant gears and everything else. I don't, yeah. uh, I'm not it sure. It seem like an easy one to uh, tear down and set back up in a new city. <laughs> right. I don't know how many trailers <laughs> that, that fun house takes. But. Um, and the creature, by the way. He has a name. I can't ever remember the creature's name, but they mentioned his name in the movie, and I have no idea what it is. Uh, but the creature was designed by Rick Baker, the legendary oh, Rick wow. Baker, one of the greatest uh, designers, creature designers of all time. Baker was still fairly early in his career at this point, although he had already made his mark on movies like Larry Cohen's It's Alive uh, and the 1976 remake of King Kong, which is probably his biggest work up to this point. Well, I mean, that, that movie was huge when it came out. Uh, and then when The Fun House was released in theaters, another film with Creature Effects by Baker was also released. Uh, and that was American Werewolf in London. It was actually released on the exact same day as The Fun House, which, oh, I, wow. which is <laughs> wild. Now, because of Baker's previous commitments to uh, other projects, including American Werewolf, he wasn't actually able to build the creature for The Fun House. He designed it. Uh, and then... He passed his design along to Craig Reardon, who we talked about last week. And then Reardon actually cast and molded and painted the creature head based on Baker's design. It's a great yeah, creature design. It is. And, oh, it's, it's, it's really cool looking. And, uh, and, and Hooper even says in the commentary that Rob Boutine like, comes by um, and yeah. helped out with some of the makeup on set. And I thought that was kind of neat. He's like not credited in the movie or anything yeah, like that. Yeah, I think that. he was just maybe helping out. Like he, and, and Rob Boutine... Uh, of course, this is a year before the thing, but Rob Boutin was actually also so. Originally, the plan was for him to actually play the creature, like he was supposed to be the guy in the in the mask, because he's like six nine or something like. Yeah, that. Rob like Boutin's a really big dude. He's but really yeah, dude. he said he saw the, somewhere along the way. Hooper saw like a a mime or maybe just you know I, I don't remember exactly where he said he was but it just had these spider-like movements and he yeah. just thought it would come across creepy or just be able to portray the character under the mask yeah yeah that 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 mime is a guy named wayne doba so he ended up getting that part because and even though he's much smaller but you know you want somebody who is a able to emote silently which is all of mine does, I guess. But, yeah. <laughs> uh, but, you know, so they got him to play that role. And I think he does a good job. I mean, I think I think the creature is very memorable in this. I think the design, I think Rick Baker's design and, and Craig Reardon's uh, execution is really good. Uh, the, the way it was originally described, I guess, in the script, it, he was going to, he was kind of described as being more just like a deformed, like a, someone with just like a birth defect, like a cleft palate kind of thing. And mm-hmm. Rick Baker didn't want it to look he felt that that was a little mean, you know, that makes sense. because there yeah. are people suffering from, you know, that, that kind of birth defect. So he kind of made it more monstrous and less human looking because he didn't want it to come across as mean spirited, uh, you know, calling someone with an actual physical deformity, you know, like a freak or a monster. He was woke before woke was a thing. <laughs> Look at that. He was, he was being thoughtful. Like all of Hooper's previous films, there is a striking visual element to this film, I think, maybe even more so than anything Hooper had done before. And I think a big reason for that is the cinematography by Andrew Laszlo. Uh, Laszlo is another dude who, like, you look at his filmography and it's like, it's pretty amazing. I mean, he did, after this, he did lots of movies, but movies like First Blood, which, of course, Hooper was originally attached to. Yeah. Poltergeist 2, which also has its connections to Hooper, uh, Inner Space, and Star Trek V, The Final Frontier. Fun. There you go. Yeah. 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 He had uh, he'd definitely seen it work on The Warriors, though, and he talks a little bit about just being the vivid colors and, and that sort of right. thing. Laszlo did a lot of movies for Walter Hill, um, the director of The Warriors, but yeah, it was The Warriors specifically that kind of got Hooper's attention because he liked that bright comic book kind of color palette of that movie 
Yeah. Uh, and, and that's what he wanted to do for this. And this also marked Hooper's first anamorphic widescreen production. The oh. first time that he'd done a movie in full and full widescreen, like uh, 233, you know, the, the widest possible anamorphic uh, widescreen, which I mean, it does really elevate the movie, I think, because it makes it, I don't know, there's something about it that you could, you could do the same script probably for 400 grand and it'd be on a grainy little film stock and still be enjoyable, I guess. But I think there's something about how legitimate they were taking, how, how serious they were taking this yeah. that by hiring someone as good as Andrew Laszlo. I mean, he's got all those colors and lens flares and like, it's a really good looking movie. Uh, and the, and this amazing production design and shooting it in widescreen, which forces you to really frame things in a, in a very cinematic way uh, that it, it kind of legitimizes the movie a little bit more than, than it might have otherwise. You know what I mean? Oh yeah, yeah absolutely. Well, and all these people, like you said, just working on it and they, you know, they, they all were like fans of uh, what's the movie kept saying nightmare alley. Um, yeah. And just being kind of fans of that carnival aspect and and with the apparent focus that hooper has like you brought up earlier with with location and and these you know just the set um it's kind of interesting everywhere else has been sort of closed in uh for like some of these things he's focused in on like uh like as far as you know the sawyer house the marston house or the hotel and yeah. eating alive you know there's like these specific spaces but and, and this one gets there but like the carnival is like such a broad place to look yeah. at so that i know morphic wide street i think helps really show like the the size of the spectacle and you could get lost in it basically yeah there's this mm. one crane shot in it uh, where it kind of cranes over the whole carnival and you kind of see everything and it's just such a great shot and one of the smoothest like crane shots like that that i've ever seen i think it is exceptionally well done yeah it really is yeah that's a that's that's my one of my favorite shots i think or one of my favorite parts of the movie is just like where they're deciding to to hang out or whatever but then the you know they're they're looking at the uh puppets and this weird stuff and the scary ride but the park starts shutting down and the yeah, yeah. lights go off and the puppets just kind of slowly like creepily just like close down and then yeah. it's just <laughs> as that shot's like panning back like it's just like it went from being this crowded place to like just like I don't know like deserted and just like there's something every creepy about an empty carnival, you know. <laughs> like carnival is noises and music and people and la like laughing and you know. And then when it shuts down, it's like it's like some places like once they shut down because some environments they're so just like filled with sights and sounds that once they're once everything's turned off and their people are gone they become really eerie like like a mall like if you were to go to a, a shopping mall and after hours and everything's closed down like it would be a it would be creepy not because of necessarily because it's a mall because malls are not inherently creepy but just because it's such a vastly different experience than what your brain is used to for a oh, mall yeah. uh, then you do that with a carnival where you've also got creepy like animatronic puppets and you know that there's a barn over here that has a two-headed cow in it uh even if he's been put <laughs> yeah. up you know he's still there <laughs> that was a real cow by the way yeah I'm, all of those all of yeah those that was that was something i was gonna ask was like is that real because it yeah, looks that was real, real. <laughs> yeah it was 100 if that if that had been an effect it would they would have won an oscar for this yeah that was yeah a, <laughs> that was a real two-faced cow yeah it's wild wow. and the one with the upper part of its jaw like missing sort of yeah. or, like split um no everybody seemed to have like their own little demands you know I, I don't remember if we said it but with like kevin conway you know he had the he agreed to do it because hooper would let him play all three carnival barkers or whatever yeah that, that's something that's fun in this is that you don't really realize it at first because i think the nudie show guy is the first one that you see mm -hmm. and he's got kind of a wig and a mustache on but then you see the other two and you're like my man, they look really alike. <laughs> then you realize that it is, in fact, the same dude. Uh, there's really no reason for that, other than I think he just thought it was going to be fun. Yeah, I think he <laughs> just thought it would be fun to like interact with what's her face that they all like three stare at her and like maybe they all kind of make eye contact. Yeah, yeah, so that it almost would be like kind of weird that like there's something eerie about her, for her like seeing them. Yeah. 
Um, I, re- I saw like a little interview with Conway about it, and that was like, I think kind of his thought process on it. But 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 as far as like the demand thing, I, I mean, you know, the anamorphic widescreen was a request from Hooper when you know he's getting to sign on to this studio thing. He said he'd always wanted to do that and uh he had like a viewfinder a little viewfinder he said since he was a kid that he, he kind of saw his world in in anamorphic Wide widescreen, widescreen. Yeah. <laughs> so like he always wanted to actually shoot a movie that way and uh, huh. so this was his chance to to finally get to do that which is so different from his last project where he was not only confined to a smaller frame but a, a much smaller frame because it had to be framed for television mm. right right <laughs> Um, he he did, you know, in some of the stuff I read, he talks about the the one thing, one of the big things that Salem was like got it besides a you know a success for him uh, was you know these requests, these kind of things were things he learned to to work out because he learned to deal in the studio system, like it, it right. kind of got him experience experience dealing with these people and how to talk to them and make arrangements for for these kind of things to happen. Yeah, he wasn't afraid to make those demands now. Right. So by all accounts, the shoot on the Funhouse was a pretty quick one uh, with only a few minor holdups involving overtime. It it did end up running about seven days over schedule. So it was originally slotted for 30 days, ended up shooting for 37 days, which is the exact same amount of time that Salem's Lot shot. So, of course, this is a much smaller movie, so it wasn't quite as frantic. But because of the film going over schedule, Hooper actually had to leave the country not long after assembling a rough cut because... He had a prior commitment in England, in London, to helm a movie called Venom. So he assembles a rough cut of the movie. It's not completed yet. Flies off to England to shoot another movie. But there are some conflicting stories about Hooper's involvement on Venom. Some say that an illness in Hooper's family caused him to have to return to the U.S. and turn the film over to director Piers Haggard. Uh, While other stories say that cost overruns and production problems plagued the film and that Hooper, uh, quote, failed to weather the storm, which resulted in him being fired and replaced by Haggard, Uh, which and the reason I mentioned that is because this is sort of a thing that we're going to that we're starting to see a bit of a trend with Hooper. You know, he gets attached to a lot of projects and ends up leaving them or not completing them, you know, and, and it does not help his reputation in the long run. I don't know if he's difficult to get along with or if he's just on a different wavelength to where certain producers and him don't don't mesh. I don't know, but it's something we continuously see. And and these are characteristics of Hooper that I think are going to play into some of the controversy that we're going to discuss next week. I, I think that things like this build up and this is part of where where the story behind Poltergeist, you know, where it kind of goes. I was just going to say, I think he's easy to uh, like dislike. Like, I mean, as far as on set and, and these sorts of things, like he get, he seems to get in a zone. I don't mean he's easy to dislike. Like he's a shitty person. I just mean like um, he's easy to misunderstand is maybe right. the better way to put that, that he seems to get focused he 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 told a story in one interview uh, about this movie that like there was a reviewer that had you know he he doesn't read many reviews but this one reviewer had writ, written like a, a great review of Salem's Lot and he invited the guy on set he wouldn't say who or which magazine it was for now but um he said that the guy came to the set for the fun house and got to hang out and uh, was going to be writing about it. But he said that he wanted an interview with Hooper and Hooper just didn't have time. And, uh, you know, told him, sorry, like that, that, that part's not going to happen. Said the guy just like got mad at him and went back and rewrote his Salem's Lot interview for the next issue of the magazine. Oh, wow. That's so <laughs> shitty. I know. It's so shitty. What a day. That's what I'm saying. He just he he's not having great experiences either. It seems like yeah, he just geez. I don't know. It's it's a it just feels like he gets shit on even when he tries to be nice. So, yeah so wow that really sucks. Maybe he comes across as a dick. <laughs> <laughs> well anyway uh, regardless of whatever happened on Venom what ends up happening is Hooper returns to the States to oversee editing on the funhouse. 
So the Funhouse is released on March 13th, 1981. It's released to mostly positive reviews, a decent box office. It made almost $8 million on a $3 million budget. So it wasn't setting the world on fire, but it was considered moderately successful. Although now it is mostly considered, much like Eaten Alive, kind of a lost Hooper film. So it's not a film that people really talk about that often. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I bet there are some people on the internet that like to talk about it, Gary. Oh, sure. <laughs> yeah. I mean, as, I mean, we're as... on the internet talking about it, but... <laughs> <laughs> We're not the only ones, though. And, you know, the thing is, is that bad reviews, as we found, if you if you need them, uh, especially with Toby Hooper, there are plenty of people that need to write them. And it sounds like they also need a nap. <laughs> This guy sounds familiar, actually. I think I, I did not intend to do this, but the name is Stanley Strangelove. I feel like I pulled this guy's <laughs> guy. Did yeah, we talk about back. him last week? Yeah. He must have went on a, he, he's, he's been on a Hooper bench, too, I guess. <laughs> Weird uh, that he didn't like, he didn't like Salem's Laws, but he just kept going. With other <laughs> Stanley Strangelove, please reach out to us online. <laughs> Uh, he says uh, the title of this review is not fun, <laughs> which I, right. I just pictured it that way. Not fun. That's that was I wish I would just left it at that. Anyway, he says, you've seen this slasher film many times before. A bunch of kids spend the night in a fun house. What if first of all, I have not seen that. Not not many times. <laughs> like that's not uh anyway. One of the girls gets to show off her body in the shower for no reason, except the director wanted to see her nude. The kids have boring sex. The kids, <laughs> the kids who have boring sex get knifed by some goon in a mask. The one girl who doesn't have sex does not get knifed by some goon in a mask. Now throw in some puppets with bobbing heads. Why? Who cares? Toby Hooper, whose only claim to fame is the miserable Texas Chainsaw Massacre, serves up another bomb in Funhouse. The effects are cheesy, which is surprising because Rick Baker did them. Funhouse is unwatchable, boring, derivative, predictable, dull. Did I say boring? Over-talkative, uninteresting. Did I say boring? Funhouse rips off Halloween and Psycho. Did I mention that this film is boring? You did. Thank you, Actually. Stanley Strangelove. <laughs> you did mention that, Stanley. Guys, I got to come clean. I'm Stanley Strangelove. <laughs> oh, we knew it. And these, uh, the, I've got two more quick ones here. And, and obviously I only picked them for the title. So hopefully the rest of the reviews hold up. Uh, this one says- You haven't read them yet? Uh, I, I skimmed through them, but this one, <laughs> the title is Fun House, more like Scum House. Yeah, that sounds sold. I'm going to watch it. <laughs> <laughs> Don't bother with this one, guys. This movie sucks the big one. Toby Hoover should be publicly lashed for making this crap, especially after serving us the frightening classic Poltergeist. Well, he did this before. Anyway, Funhouse is about a group of teens that gets locked up in a carnival's funhouse for the night. Ho-hum. I can't remember who the killer was. I fell asleep, and I really didn't care. The sooner these teens were killed, the sooner the film ended. I gave it one star. I don't know. That's, that's I love these people who, you know, rant about a movie that they didn't even watch the whole thing right <laughs> apparently he does not know that there was even a freak involved like yeah. he's just like yeah. i don't remember who the killer was i feel like he would stand out if you saw him yeah he's hard to miss and this is what have we learned don't steal from cardies should be called outhouse that's the title <laughs> that's pretty good that's pretty good <laughs> labo slasher flick that becomes comical it's so bad Teens make themselves targets when one of the group steals money from the carnival ringleader more so than the murder by the monster they happen to witness while hiding in the funhouse. That sentence was poor. That sentence doesn't make much sense. Yeah. <laughs> Apparently witnessing a murder is no big deal, so the teens continue with their makeout sessions unburdened. Most horrifying scene is when Sylvia Miles strips down to a corset garter belt and stockings to prostitute herself on a dirty mattress on the floor to the deformed, drooling monster hiding behind a Frankenstein mask and gloves. Vile. Disgusting. 
just plain weird. What happens to the little boy in the film makes you wonder if Hooper wanted us to think something else happened to him. Therefore, bailing on any opportunity to capitalize on that character's development and role in the story. The disconnected, apathetic parents are more revolting than the monster, making the overall film just, just plain pointless. Check out Elizabeth Barrage in far better works, such as Amadeus. Biggest crime is the opening scene. That's a total ripoff. <laughs> We're going to talk about that opening scene. <laughs> but, uh, I mean, I love Sylvia Miles in this movie. She's fun. She is really fun. Uh, and she's barely in it, but... Uh, yeah, Hooper tells the story that she uh, she's uh, jerking off the monster and... Uh, wipes as she's like wiping her hands on the sheet she turns around to him and is like did i just throw away my whole career <laughs> <laughs> uh, and and well I, I think maybe what he's referring to about the um where hooper wanted us to think something happened to the kid i don't know i i think maybe he's referring to the carney who like rescues the boy maybe who is a little he's pretty creepy it's a little too into like cleaning the child you know all right that, <laughs> that guy is super weird that was mort rabinowitz's brother i think that played yeah her role. herb herb rabinowitz yeah and uh herb, I think who he names goes, their like, children he... herb and mort <laughs> mr uh, and mrs rabinowitz I was about to say the rabinowitz family <laughs> yeah. um i think he he goes by herb robin though like he doesn't he doesn't use like his whole name Oh, uh, and and is like you know if you if you want to IMDb the guy Herb I Robins know. that's what he's on. but uh, he is I mean he's good it's just he's a little the way he plays it is very like ugh, icky <laughs> but so this movie was it was and it was kind of ignored or it is still kind of ignored by some people as just another of the like hundreds of slasher movies that were being released in the early 80s you know despite the fact that in my opinion it's not really a slasher movie uh and and i had i will say i've never i had never seen this movie before this was my first time watching this one so i was under the impression that it was a slasher movie and i think even last week when i announced that this is what we were doing next i might have even called it a slasher movie but by this time and i mean this is the slasher boom obviously friday the 13th had already come out christmas evil prom night terror train my bloody valentine all of these had come out and they all had that whole like teenagers in peril thing going on that the funhouse also has and i think that's why it i think it's why it gets lumped in with those movies even though there's not really a slasher killer mm -hmm. uh though the early scene that first scene it's a fun and i i think kind of funny the you know once you know that the movie's not really a slasher movie, it's kind of funny that they did a kind of a slasher movie fake out at the beginning of the movie. Yeah. Uh, that is kind of one part giallo, one part like Hitchcock psycho, and then like two parts John Carpenter's Halloween. Cause it is, I mean, and Toby Hooper even says it was 100% like an homage to, to John Carpenter's Halloween. Cause he pulls out, you know, it's the point of view, he pulls off the mask, but then the shower scene is very, very psycho. You know that all of the uh, puppets that are in her room there, for some odd reason, uh, they borrowed those from Sherry Lewis. Really? Yeah, Lamb Chop. <laughs> yeah, <old> Lamb Chop. <laughs> no, she was in the demonic puppet. Uh, she just in... <laughs> hey, listen, she is, yeah, she is an extremely evil sorceress. <laughs> like, didn't, is... uh, didn't Lamb Chop eventually uh, go on to be in The Witch? <laughs> I see what you <laughs> did there. Isn't that that that's that's a goat? Oh, Todd. What? Well, Lamb Chop's <laughs> a very good actor. <laughs> I, I do like that opening scene, though. I think it's really fun. I think it definitely gives the audience the impression that they're in for a typical slasher movie, uh, and that that may not have helped the movie in the long run because you know, again, this kind of gets lumped in with slasher movies. And the the scene was not originally in the script. That was shot like at the end of production. They had done some test screenings and they kind of felt like they needed a stronger opening. Like they needed one of those like horror movie, like kind of cold open scenes. Mm -hmm. So they added this scene to it. I got to tell you mm -hmm. though, if my brother kept opening the shower curtain and fake stabbing, I would have to set up some boundaries. It's yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's, she doesn't seem very, um, disturbed by the fact she doesn't try to like cover herself up when she notices when it's her brother like it's it's uh she just screams at him 
and you know it's it's a very odd scene that's a he's a creepy kid that's a creepy yeah. kid he seems that whole family seems he, dysfunctional and, the, uh, yeah i mean she's the, amy's the most normal one of the bunch really and but her her mom and dad are very disinterested her brother i don't think he speaks a word the whole movie does he oh does he i don't think he does i don't they think he, he ever he speaks does. a word yeah, because you just kind of see him sneak out of the house, and he's by himself at the carnival, so he's not really talking to anyone, and then he gets traumatized. I, mean, I don't think he ever speaks a word. It's very strange. That is but, that is very weird. But he's going to grow up to be a serial killer. I mean, I'm pretty sure that's yeah. part of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was practicing in that opening scene. <laughs> there's a there's a sequel to this somewhere where he's where he's it, the killer. It is interesting, though. Like, I mean, do you think – you're talking about the slasher thing. Do you think Hooper's – trying to make a slasher here like this is his version of it really i don't really know i don't really think hooper thinks in those terms really you know so i, I think he's just trying to make the fun house it is what it is i don't think he's necessarily trying to do a slasher thing i mean it does have some tropes of slasher movies like the you've got the basically with teenagers being killed off and by, by a maniac or whatever but it also you've got these like slasher movie tropes that the movie really it kind of upends them immediately because you've got your your final girl Amy shows yeah. her boobs in the very first scene. Final right. girls don't do that, right? <laughs> final girls don't do that. Well, it's just so, interesting. You think with the Psycho or the Halloween homage, like there's, uh, but that was an afterthought too, you know. Yeah, true. So I don't know. It just it, it's weird because it, it seems like maybe he was trying to set up that for that, but he doesn't. Like you said, maybe he doesn't think in those terms. He clearly doesn't want to do like a killer. What what people would expect from a slasher, like the killer right. walking around killing people. The killing doesn't even start till later in the movie, and you know it's just uh, he's setting up atmosphere and and you know. He's got his way of of doing these things, and he's sticking with it here. Well, yeah, I think the thing with this movie is that it really is kind of like a, for a lot of the movie, it feels like a hangout movie. You know, mm. it's just about these teenagers hanging out at the carnival and, and the things that they're seeing. They're seeing all these different attractions, and it's kind of like there's not a lot of horror going on other than when you occasionally will cut to Sylvia Miles' character, and like you see her get, get killed and stuff, but it's not really doing a lot of horror stuff until the end, although it's still got a kind of a overall atmosphere, which again, this is, you know, something we keep saying on these Toby Hooper movies is we talk about the atmosphere of the movies, but it's, it's a really interesting structure to this because it really is just about these teenagers hanging out until they witness something that they, they're not supposed to, but that happens a good ways into the movie, you know? So I, I almost feel like he threw that opening scene in, to show you like, oh yeah, we, this is a horror movie, even though this is a fake out, like it's still a horror movie opening, but it does kind of set all, almost unfair expectations for the viewer because you're expecting something, you're expecting one thing and getting something totally different, you know? Mm. Doesn't seem to be very many good people in this movie either. Like that kid's just like walking along the road and uh, the one guy starts to pick him up and then just pulls yeah. a shotgun out or something. And then just laughs at the kid because the kid, he scared the shit out of the kid. <laughs> yeah, that's just kind of fucked up. But by the way, too, we didn't mention this, but but Hooper, you know, during the making of this movie, uh, he's also dealing with the fact that he almost dies twice during the filming of the movie. One, because Hooper during this. Yeah, Hooper does. Once is during that scene uh they were talking about with the truck and he apparently got bit by a brown recluse on Jesus. set oh, and uh had a hole in his hand he said Jeez. and uh the other one was uh he said they were filming some stuff in the carnival and an extra lunged at him and he freaked out like why is this guy coming at me and it's because a huge piece of one of the rides this feels more like accurate to real life what i remember of carnivals uh it comes flying off of the ride, this huge piece, and it hits it, it like hits something behind Hooper, but it's bouncing back at his head. It's about oh, to hit his head, and the extra lunges out and sticks his hand in front of it to like knock it away and saves Hooper. Says he could have saved his life. It wow. broke the extra's arm. Jesus, that, wow. that it hit. And they better uh, give him a bonus. But yeah, no kidding. <laughs> so that's crazy. Uh, thought that was kind of wild. My other favorite story from the making of, though, by the way, I meant to mention this earlier, too, is he said the, the scene where they're smoking pot uh, behind yeah. the tent, which is another 
slasher movie no no right exactly mm. he says they they shot that like five times and he said that so the take you're seeing is probably like the fifth time he said what was really weird about it was as they were filming in and they're panning back and the kids are starting to walk back towards the carnival it starts raining and he's like wow this is weird it's not it's not even supposed to be raining right now and so then he realizes he looks up he sees it this doesn't look like rain and then looks up and realizes that uh one of the rides the spinning you know the one that's like spinning around with the cars that are also spinning around yeah Yeah. yeah. it's like uh the ad never yelled cut on that ride during the like 20 minutes it took to shoot that scene where they retook it five times oh Oh, shit these things are supposed to go like four minutes at a time but these people have been in the middle of that ride the whole oh, entire God. time and they're <laughs> throwing up oh and no freaking out. <laughs> <laughs> and so, oh god oh. And so they're he's getting like, puke the rained upon them oh, he's like, they cut it and they had to get an ambulance out like the people couldn't walk they couldn't do anything. <laughs> <laughs> that is they just been running the whole time they were <laughs> oh man so i want to go ahead and do we actually forgot to do this last week but our uh our segment called for viewing we forgot to do it on salem's lot guys oh <laughs> can you believe it uh, uh, i realized it after we had gotten done but whatever you know maybe <sighs> Sorry, well, we, you're not gonna no, watch Nosferatu or something. I, I was gonna say we're not, yeah. gonna, not gonna have any <laughs> vampire movies to recommend. <laughs> uh, but this one, I want to go ahead and do it on this one, even though it's, it might be a little bit early uh, normally for us to do this. But I think it's gonna play into some conversation about this. So I want to go ahead and say, for my further viewing, I want to stay away from slasher movies because I don't really think this is a slasher movie. I think this is a monster movie, and I think it's a movie about a somewhat sympathetic monster. I mean, he's definitely still bad. It's definitely evil, but he is also one that is. So I think he's supposed to be somewhat sympathetic, and I think that is based on some of the iconography of the, that Hooper puts in the film. One of which is going to be, I guess, a movie that I would be one of my further viewing choices, which is the original Frankenstein. Although oddly, the Frankenstein poster that's in this movie is actually the Lon Chaney uh, Frankenstein, not the Boris Karloff, but. That's kind of an obvious one, you know, Frankenstein, because you see the monster dressed up as Frankenstein. So obviously, Hooper is trying to evoke that movie, the classic well, the Universal. Well, the parents are watching uh, Bride of Frankenstein. Bride of Frankenstein, yeah. And mm. because this is a Universal movie, they've got the rights to all that stuff, you know. Uh, so I do think that Hooper is trying to make you somewhat sympathize with with the monster in this because Frankenstein's monster is sympathetic. You know, even though he's still murderous and, you know, but he is kind of a, a, it's not necessarily his fault, right? Mm -hmm. But if you want to go a little more cult movie, kind of a more obscure, I would recommend Todd Browning's 1932 film Freaks, which I think had to be at least somewhat of like an inspiration on this, you know? Because uh, obviously it's about a freak show, and and it's and it it's about a, a freak show where the freaks themselves are the most sympathetic people in the movie. Uh, it's the it's the regular hum- humans in it who are kind of shitty. So I, I think that's a pretty good one. If you've never seen Todd Browning's Freaks, I would I would rec- definitely recommend it because it's it's a it's a great movie and is still disturbing to this day. And if I'm recommending Todd Browning's Freaks, I also have to, there's another movie, it's a little more obscure, that was actually directed by Alex Winter, you know, from Bill and Ted. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, called Freaked, F-R-E-A-K-E-D, Freaked. Freaked it came, out, came out in the early 90s, 1993. And it's a, another one about a freak show. And it is just wild. It is just insane. Like the creature effects are insane. Mr. T plays a bearded woman, I think, in it. Um, <laughs> Keanu Reeves is uncredited as like the dog face boy. But if you want some like really good creature effects, check it out because it the the it's like everyone's all the freaks in it are, are very cartoonish, like almost like a almost like a Dick Tracy villain kind oh, of cartoonish, fun. you know? Yeah. Uh, so very very much like a kind of. I don't know, exaggerated kind of deformity. Mm. Uh, and then the main, I guess, like the main carnival barker in it is played by an actual insane person, Randy Quaid, 
So it's a yep. very fun movie, though. <laughs> uh, it, it really is. It's it's super fun. And maybe I'm sure we'll maybe talk about it on the show one day if we can figure out where to fit it in. But I would recommend checking that one out if you want something that you, you may not have seen before. Yeah, I'll throw Nightmare Alley in there, too, since I know uh, Hooper referenced that a lot in some of the stuff I saw on him uh, as being an influence or something that he was a fan of and thought about yeah. a lot when he was making this movie. It's about a carnival like a sideshow thing too i noticed that you know all the frankenstein references throughout and um, it made me think of the frankenstein with robert de niro yeah, and the, i always really enjoyed one. that one huh <laughs> it's not good <laughs> I, I like it it's uh i, the I kenneth enjoyed kenneth brana one or yeah kenneth brana yeah kenneth brana helen barm carter um there's there's a couple other folks in there it's i mean kenneth I like brana it. directed fun. it though yeah 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 I mean, I haven't seen it in years, but I remember it not being very good. Uh, although, I I don't know. It, it, it might be worth a revisit. I know I, I love, like, of that time era, you know, Coppola also did Dracula, which is mm-hmm. an incredible movie, I think. Yeah. I always kind of watch those two, you know, as a double feature. That's a lot of fun. Yeah. I don't so, know that I ever even saw it, but the idea of Robert De Niro as the Frankenstein monster, uh, that's interesting to me. Yeah. It, yeah. It's it's worth taking a look. It's, does he have yeah, lines or is he it, just would, like oh he does have lines? It's no, yeah, it's, it's much a, more based more, on the novel. Yeah, it's truer to the novel. Yeah. I have nipples, can you milk me? <laughs> <laughs> of all the iconic of all the iconic Robert De Niro lines. <laughs> That's the one. Well, that's, that's the one, one of his iconic mind. lines. Okay, <laughs> beggars can't be choosers. Uh, so, one thing that I, I've started to notice about Hooper's work, and uh, something I think that you can probably say about all of his movies up through the Funhouse, is that these are stories about people who kind of live on the fringes of normal society. I mean, you've got the family from Texas Chainsaw, you've got you know Judd from Eaten Alive, you've got even Barlow and Straker from Salem's Lot. They kind of are outcasts. Uh, these are folks who live kind of outside what is generally considered normal. Killing people and, and being cannibals is very outside normal, I would hope, for most people. But uh, that is kind of, I think that's especially relevant even with the carnies at the center of the Funt House, you know. Uh, I think these are the kind of, these seem to be the kind of characters that Hooper almost relates to. Like maybe he feels like that kind of outsider. I have to wonder if, because I think he, he does seem like he's an outsider at heart. He seems like he's much more at home you know, making weird little movies, weird little exploitation movies necessarily than, than like studio movies. Uh, even this is a, as a studio movie feels, I mean, it is pretty scuzzy for a fairly polished studio movie, you know? Mm. Uh, so I, it's something that it's funny. It wasn't anything that I ever really thought about with Hooper, but as we've watched this movie, I'm like, man, he really does like to make movies about these kind of outsiders and he, and he can make them sympathetic. Like, with the Sawyer family and I think with with the monster here, not necessarily with like Judd or, or Barlow. They're they're not sympathetic at all. But uh I don't know. It, it was just an interesting theme that I I had not really expected to come up when I started watching these movies. Just the theme of family, you mean? Just the yeah, you know. Yeah, like, just like the Fast and Furious movies. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> too, too bad uh, Toby's it, not with us anymore. He could have directed one of those. Oh my God, that would have been amazing. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, he, if he would have got there earlier too, we would have had like Paul Walker with a deformed Vin Diesel. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, Vin Diesel's not deformed? Watch don't, your mouth. Don't speak ill of Vin Diesel in the presence of Gary Horn. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So just as we could have said about Eaten Alive and Texas Chainsaw, for that matter, the uh, the Fun House is kind of light on plot. It's light on character work. It is, I think, because it's once again, this is Hooper more concerned with an experience, you know, a feeling, an atmosphere. You know, like he, he wants you to feel like you're in a nightmare. Only this time, you know, it's almost like the characters are experienced this sort of artificial nightmare because that's kind of what a carnival fun house is right Mm. uh this sort of nightmare world that's being created but it's one that's supposed to be kind of over supposed to end when the ride is over right but for them when it ends they just they find themselves in an actual real life kind of nightmare scenario where they're being hunted by a deformed monster when the ride ends the terror begins (laughs) 
And uh, I think you said it like you were like doing it for a comedy though or something. (laughs) It's like a romantic comedy. (laughs) Once again, I think the star of the show here is, which is starting to be a regular thing with these movies is the production design. You know, uh, Hooper wants to create this, this world of, of his film. You know, we talked about a little bit earlier in the show, but uh, using both sound and visuals, like he really just creates he has this way of creating a, a, a these just surreal worlds that he just drops you right down into, you know, uh, which is which is really incredible. And this, of course, is very very different here than what he's doing in, let's say, Texas Chainsaw. It's a much different world, but still that kind of dark, just surreal nightmare world. Can like you wouldn't want to find yourself in any of these scenarios. Mm. Yeah, he he definitely, and and it's that thing too where logically it all doesn't have to make sense you know like as far right. as the, well like you know just playing around with it before but like the idea of how huge that fun house must be you yeah, know yeah. like they should yeah. be able to walk out on the track and it's you know there's like two minutes of ride you know yeah, yeah just follow things. the track out the door yeah <laughs> but, <laughs> it's really easy it's, it's really, there's one way in there's one way out uh it's not like a, it's not, you're not in a maze but yeah it, you, you're not supposed to think about those kind of things. If you start thinking about those kind of things in a movie like this, like it's, and and that's not necessarily to give like plot holes a pass necessarily, but I think that a lot of people put more emphasis on those types of plot holes than they should, because that's, you have to know what, like you got to consider the intention of the filmmaker, you know what I mean? And his intention here is to take you on a ride and a scary ride. And there that's what go. he does. I think. Uh, now, before we get any further, I do want to, because Todd, you've been a little bit quiet Yeah, <laughs> on this, maybe I mean, it's because you're hungover. I was going to say, people I can't see of- Justin right now, but he's already just like rubbing his head. So it's just like, <laughs> I'm not sure my hangover can handle this today. <laughs> but Todd, I think it's time. I think it's time to hear Todd's take. You know, because I hadn't enjoyed many of the toby hooper well i hadn't enjoyed two out of the three so far so i was like look i'm just gonna keep my expectations low or non-existent and again just try to soak it all in and embrace it for what it is and you know just see what this is all about and um i had fun with it it's it's yeah it's an okay it's an okay it's an i'm not just like oh fuck this movie it's a it's a fun movie. Like, you know, if you wanted to watch it as part of a horror binge during October, it it's a, it's a good choice. If you wanted to get together with a bunch of friends and, you know, you know, play drinking games or do like a, your own MST three K riff to it, it would work for that as well. Uh, you know, it's just a fun, you know, Friday night with a, you know, whoever you're with and get some pizza and just watch a movie. It's, it's fun. It's not, yeah, it's not the greatest thing since, uh, you know, sliced bread or whatever, but I had fun. I had fun watching it. There's some stuff that you got to kind of attribute to like, Oh, you know, this isn't, maybe this doesn't look right. Or the, you know, the creature face kind of looks a little plasticky or whatever, yeah. but I mean, on the whole, it's a slobber though lots of drool <laughs> um but yeah i had fun with it so well i, I that's kind of how i feel like I, I i would never call the fun house like a lost masterpiece this no, nobody's gonna put this on the greatest horror movies of all time list like they would texas chainsaw massacre but i, I also don't think it deserves to be forgotten and i do think it sort of has gotten lumped in with a lot of those slasher movies of the era because mm-hmm. honestly this whether whether hooper intended it or not i think universal saw this as like a slasher movie. I think they were releasing it and intending for it to be part of that boom because they were so popular at the time. Mm. And this is much better than a lot of those. I mean, we we talk about movies like, you know, My Bloody Valentine and, and you know, Terror Train and, you know, stuff like that because those are the better ones that we remember. And Terror Train's not even that good. But those are the more fun ones that, like, we remember. But, like, there were, when I say that there were hundreds being released at the time, there were literally, like, 300 slasher movies released in a period of like four years it's insane wow um i mean and the majority of them are garbage like really (laughs) really bad garbage but they but it's it's it is interesting that in 
my years of life, I hadn't, this had never been on my radar. Um, and yeah, I mean, I've always known about it. I actually owned it already. Cause I had bought it as part of like one of those DVD, like it has like four movies in it. Those little box that you find at like oh, target yeah. or whatever. Yeah. And this was one of them. So I've owned it for a while. And then I actually, in order to, to work on this episode, I bought the shout factory Blu-ray, which is actually a really great release. And, and, and it, not that we're like a Blu-ray uh, review podcast, but the, the visuals on that, like the way they've cleaned it up, mm. the transfer is remarkable. It looks nice. really good, really good. And I'm sure if you go streaming it, it's probably based on that, that cleaned up Blu-ray. Yeah. That's what, uh, but that's it's what we did. Yeah. It's, it looks great. It really does. The colors pop really well. So um, you wouldn't necessarily see that if you had watched it like on VHS back in, you know, when we were first getting into horror movies, Gary, well, it would have been cropped. It would have been cropped. So you wouldn't have seen that beautiful, like widescreen production. So yeah, because it would have been panned and scanned. Well, but that's I the, just, where I was, sorry, where I was going with that is just that. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's the, the part of it is, it's like, I thought the movie was fine. I don't think it's like an amazing movie either. But it's it's just sad where I was what I was thinking of is just that, you know, it wasn't on my radar at all. Like, how have I not really heard much about this film? That sucks. It deserves better than that, because like you're yeah. saying, there's a, a a ton of crappy slasher movies out there, movies that would this would fit this category, I guess. And yeah. uh, and this one deserves to at least be acknowledged because there's some fun stuff. And I mean, I think that. Oh, um, uh, uh, Kevin Conway. I think he is really great in this. I mean, I think he's really fun. He's a really good villain. Like you really, you, he makes you hate him, man. But there's something about that guy, about his, I don't know. I, I mentioned it before, but he's just got, he's just one of those very charismatic kind of character actors. I would have liked to have seen him in more. And I know he was a working actor throughout his entire career. Like it wasn't like he was out of work, but he's never been a guy that like I've, he seems like he should be one of those actors where it's like, oh, it's that guy again. You know, you see him in these like small but memorable character roles in movies. And I don't know that that's ever the case. I mean, his other most, his most high profile role is in one episode of Star Trek where he's under <laughs> Klingon makeup, right? So. Right. <laughs> Hooper said he had seen him in a Stallone movie before this. I think it was, um, I'm trying to think, I looked this up, uh, what it, what it would have been. Uh, but he thought he was really, really good in it. Oh, Paradise Alley. Okay. Paradise very, Alley. Very early Stallone. Yeah, yeah. So this would have been... Well, that's the only one that I could find that it seemed like... Well, that had Stallone and was before this. Right, right. <laughs> so. Yeah. I do think, though, that this movie has... I mean, it it has Hooper's fingerprints all over it. You know, it's it, it really does feel like a Toby Hooper movie. He's got this... I mean he still has that scuzzy exploitation like just through line through his career, even not necessarily in, in a little bit in Salem's lot, you know, especially with that, that stuff at the end that, that last finale, I mean, he could only go so far on network TV, but that finale in the house, mm -hmm. but he, he, he's got that. The heart of his movie seems to be like, he likes, these scuzzy exploitation movies. And I, I don't think, I don't know that he would consider himself an exploitation filmmaker. And again, this is made for a major studio. This is in fact, Hooper's first movie made for a major studio for theatrical release. You know, uh, this is a big studio movie, but it does still retain its Toby Hooperness. You know, it's got that weird world, that weird vibe that you get from these Toby Hooper movies. And it was, it, it kind of plays an interesting part, I think, in Toby Hooper's career, because even though it didn't set the world on fire, like he was never known as from Toby Hooper, director of Texas Chainsaw Massacre and The Fun House. Like you never hear that, right. <laughs> but it does play an interesting role in his career because this movie, along with Salem's Lot, would help kind of bridge the gap from Hooper's early exploitation movie days to his next film, which is a major studio production and the biggest movie of his career. I meant to mention this earlier, but this was the first movie mixed at the uh, Universal Studios uh, Hitchcock Theater, uh, oh, yeah. which I just found like a fascinating little tidbit about yeah. it. But because one of Hooper's other requests besides the anamorphic widescreen was uh, 
he got to do surround sound and all of that stuff. And he was not used to that. So he said, uh, it, this was like, you could put everything was on like a huge floppy disc and you like brought it in. You could put it in there and then, and, and mix the sound in the Hitchcock theater. And I thought that was kind so of, this is like state of the art at the time. Right. Yeah. Well, I guess we should mention, cause we haven't really mentioned it, but the movies, uh, score, which is very different from, you know, his early horror movies, which were more, basically scoreless it was just like dissonant sounds and texas chainsaw and eaten alive he had a much more traditional score with salem's lot of course uh the the score here is by john beale a a composer by the name of john beale and producer uh, mace newfield he had insisted on them doing an old-fashioned orchestral score as opposed to like the kind of synth score synthesizer scores that were more common in horror movies at the time and i honestly think that's that was a really good decision because while i love synth scores they very much date a movie yeah you know they very much make it feel of a certain time and i'm not saying that this movie feels timeless i mean it still very much feels like it's in the early 1980s uh, because of people's dumb hairdos and stuff (laughs) but it does there's something a little bit more timeless about it because it it's shot in a way it's shot like a big studio production even though you're shooting kind of exploitation material but you're doing it like you're doing a big studio movie and then you add a big orchestral score just like you would you know the biggest prestige production and the score is really good i think Mm. i think it's a really good score and it's just it's one of those things that you don't think about necessarily but because you hear big you know orchestral scores in movies but if you think about uh, you don't hear them a lot in a movie like this right yeah, you know, in a, in a little low budget horror movie. Yeah, it so is interesting little, just how much they put into this. Like you said, yeah, like taking it, really it seriously. It really elevates it to be more than what it maybe should have been, you know, or would have been in other hands, or had it been treated differently, or had it been the little four hundred thousand dollar production that they had originally intended. It might have been a very different movie. I'm honestly curious about what that movie would have looked like, and what it would have sounded like. And what it would have felt like, because I, you know, if you, if you had given the the guy who made Eaten Alive that kind of budget to make this same script, I'd be very curious about how it would have turned out. It kind of, it would have been cool, but you know, I think, but I like the way this one turned out as well. You know, it's funny too, just that that he gets attached to this movie. Uh, not to dwell on it too much, but the one of, one of the interesting things I, I did hear on the commentary too was that he talked a little about. You know, he, he's lumped into a, a genre director. You know, we've heard him talk about that before, but yeah, um, he gets asked, you know, why this one? Why, why would you get into this one? And like, you know, this is the time of the slasher. Like, this is the perfect time to bring back Leatherface or yeah. something like that. You know, like, why is why is he not around? They're they're working off this. And did they have intentions for this? this character to be like part of a franchise. He was like, well, we're, we're getting into that scenario. He's like, but he said him and John uh, Millis, uh, the guy who John wrote, Millius, the, yeah, Millius, the, who wrote Conan and stuff. Yeah. yeah. He said that uh, they had a, a, you know, a Texas chainsaw movie and they, they had, had been, like a treatment for a sequel, I think. Yeah, yeah. And they had been pitching it around. He said that they tried like hell to get it made, but nobody wanted reason, to do it. Nobody wanted to touch it. So That's crazy just, because I mean, it's, you know, now, you know, you've got a successful movie. People are going to jump on it and people were trying to get him to do, there, there were years where people, that's all they wanted him to do was a Texas Chainsaw sequel. <laughs> yeah. And then at this time, he can't get it done when he wants to do it. Right. And it's later on down the line, like as the we continue of, his story, we'll find out that he does end up making one and kind of makes it under, under duress, <laughs> you could say. <laughs> so here's a little fun little side note. So not long after Salem's Lot, Hooper was approached by none other than Steven Spielberg. Remember, they... They were kind of office neighbors over on the Universal set for a time. Uh, He was approached by Steven Spielberg to direct a film called Night Skies. It's a film about aliens who tormented a family, right? Uh, Hooper, unfortunately, had to turn it down because he was actually already working on The Fun House. So he couldn't do this movie for Steven Spielberg, you know, biggest director in the world at this time. But he would, of course, get his chance to work with Spielberg soon enough. So while Night Skies never really came together, it's one of the the famous unmade films 
many of the ideas from Night Skies were reworked into two different movies. They took some ideas from this and they, they put them in a movie that Spielberg directed called uh, E.T. the Extraterrestrial. You may have heard of it. Uh, and then they took some other elements of it for uh, uh, the script for a film that we're going to talk about next week for our next episode in this Toby Hooper series. And actually the last episode in this uh, first part of this Toby Hooper series before we take a small uh, detour, we'll say. And that is Toby Hooper's 1982 hit film Poltergeist. Yeah. Yeah, so we're talking about that next week. If you guys want to stream Poltergeist, it's pretty easy to find, but head to cinemashock.net. You'll find all the information. We've always got links where you can stream the movies, uh, where you you can find them to rent or to buy through the various streaming services. They're on our website. Uh, You can also find all of our episode archives there on cinemashock.net. You can find links to our merch. You can find, what else can you find there? You can find places where you can subscribe and please do subscribe please rate and review and you can find places where you can you can find links to where you can follow all of us on the social media as if well. you click just the right spot you can find nudes of justin's mom hmm. yep so hmm. like one of those dvd easter eggs from back yeah. in the day yeah, like yeah. where you could you know remember the one where you could uh like watch memento in chronological order oh, the hidden yeah. Feature? yeah it's let me tell you it's real boring that way <laughs> it, is, it takes away all of the suspense do not do that <laughs> um uh, anyway for what it's worth too by the way i don't know why i just stumbled into this i think i was trying to see if you could stream it anywhere because i was thinking about watching something here in a little bit uh nightmare alley that movie uh on may 25th 2021 is getting a big criterion release it looks like oh really so yeah nice Nice. very cool so stay tuned folks for that one (laughs) uh so hey where can you guys be found on the internet if people want to follow you i am at this is gary horn all spelled out (laughs) i don't know i just pulled that one (laughs) oh god we gotta get out of here um, so it used to be rock and roll, Gary, all spelled out. You had to explain there wasn't in rock in roll. Yeah, and now and now are, I was like, no, why did I no, decide to bring that joke or that thing back now? <laughs> just now, you're no longer, you're no longer rock and rolling. You're just no. Gary Horn. Especially after last night, I've learned that that's just, <laughs> yeah, I'm too old to rock and roll. <laughs> I'm too old to rock and roll anymore. <laughs> uh, how about you, Todd? I'm at Mr. Todd A. Davis on all the socials, and if you're interested in Star Trek, you can come find the Computer Resume podcast, where we cover all of the Star Trek franchise in chronological order, and that's at Computer Resume on all the socials. Uh, you can also uh, check out Gary's other podcast. This is Pro Wrestling. They're doing a fun uh, history of pro wrestling, kind of like what we do, you know, with movies. Yeah. Where, where you know, you're where they're telling a story. Uh, and are you doing that every week? Is that a weekly thing? It the is a history yep. thing. We're okay, up to cool. Frank Gotch versus George Hack and Schmidt. Uh, nice. We worked our way into that era. We're we're like in the the 30s and 40s right now. Cool. We're, we're, the first the first part of it is is a brief framework of the history of pro wrestling, and then we're just going to start doing deep dives into actual characters and that. Yeah, sort it's of a great thing. idea. I mean, I, it was my idea, so you're welcome for that, Gary. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> I am at Justin underscore Bishop. My dog's. You can probably hear my dog barking, maybe, because that means it's time for me to go, I guess. <laughs> we are at cinema underscore shock on Twitter and Instagram. Find us on Facebook and stuff, too. And until next week, may the wings of liberty never lose a feather. Be excellent to each other. Johnny has the keys. <laughs> Just, <laughs> I'm sorry, you're guys. Yawning, I, yeah, but... I'm sorry. I, this is... <laughs> I actually feel much better now. This this is giving me a jolt of energy. So you guys want to meet up for a beer or something? Oh, oh God, no. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> this is the most sober I've been doing this podcast in a long time. <laughs> <laughs>